Good morning, everybody. Welcome to your moment with Minsberg. The top 10, actually, we had to include 20 questions because we got over uh, 200 questions submitted, um, burning questions for Henry Minsberg. Um, this is hosted by the International Master's Program um, for Managers, which is a program that was founded by Henry Minsberg. My name is Ron Dirksen. And I'm the Global Executive Director of the IMPM program. Um, I'm going to be doing a few little introductions. And then after that, we're going to go straight into, uh, straight into the questions. So we had over 200 questions submitted. And so it was quite an ordeal for Henry to, to pick the top 10. We actually included 20 here. Some of them will have very short answers. Some of them will have slightly uh, longer answers. Um, we have all continents uh, except Antarctica represented today, over 25 countries. Um, feel free to comment uh, or post questions in the chat box. Um, Professor Brigham, who I will introduce shortly, will be monitoring the chat room. Unfortunately, we won't have um, any time to answer your questions with Minsberg live. Um, in the chat, but um, Professor Brigham is going to uh, answer your questions um, and uh, look at your comments uh, as well as he can. Just so you know, this webinar will be recorded and posted online afterwards. And um, don't worry, your, uh, your pictures won't be shown, so there's, there's no, uh, no reason to worry. Um, we've kind of ordered the questions in the, in a, um, in the following order. Um, we're going to start with leadership questions, some strategy questions, some questions about education, um, and then the pandemic, uh, and then the future of management. Um, I wanted to introduce you to two people. Uh, the first one is Martin Brigham. Martin has served uh, on the faculty at Lancaster University since 2000. He's the program chair and worldwide academic director of the International Master's Program for Managers, uh, which is ranked number one international uh, management program for several years in a row. As an educator, Professor Brigham uh, gained worldwide recognition with the Financial Times ranking where his teaching and leadership in organizational behavior, corporate responsibility, and business ethics ranks among the world's top 10. So Professor Brigham, uh, who's on the screen now, is our worldwide academic director for the IMPM program, and he will be monitoring the chat for you. Uh, the second person I'd like to introduce is Professor Carl Moore. Professor Moore will be facilitating uh, this session and uh, asking the questions uh, with Henry Minsberg. Uh, professor Moore is an associate professor at McGill University in Canada. He holds a joint appointment in the Department of Strategy and Organization at the Desotel Faculty of Management and the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery at McGill's Faculty of Medicine. He writes a weekly column for Forbes.com called Rethinking Leadership. And Professor Moore also hosts his own weekly radio show with CEOs and other leaders. He's interviewed Justin Trudeau, Mohammed Yunus, Sir Richard Branson, and countless others. Um, these interviews also appear in a weekly column in Canada's The National Post and are translated into French for Quebec Les Affaires. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce you to Professor Minsberg, who most of you know already, so uh, I don't think I need to go into great detail, but as you may know, he's the Cleghorn Professor of Management Studies at the Desotel Faculty of Management in McGill and has been there since 1968. Uh, he's an officer of the Order of Canada and an officer of the National Order of Quebec and a member of the Strategic Management Society. He has 21 honorary doctorates, um, and that seems to be going up every year, Henry, so I can't keep up with how many honorary doctorates you, you get. He's written over 15 books and over 150 articles on management. And some of his most notable books are Managers, Not MBAs, The Rise and Fall of Strategic Planning, Simply Managing, and one of his latest passions, which is Rebalancing Society. He's the founder of the International, Program, uh, International Master's Program for Managers, 
and also the International Masters for Health Leadership, and also owns his own company uh, called Coaching Ourselves. Uh, his emphasis has been on the importance of emergent strategy as an, as an alternative or complement to deliberate strategy. Uh, he's, uh, he's an avid canoer, skier, and uh, you can see behind him some beaver sculptures. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just behind him, which is a passion of his. And uh, just wanted to mention that um, Martin is based uh, out of the UK in Lancaster. And even though myself, Carl and Henry are all in Quebec, uh, I myself am at home. There's a snowstorm outside. Carl Moore has braved uh, the snowstorm to go to McGill University. So he's at McGill University. And Henry is in the countryside where he lives. So with that, I will pass on uh, the uh, questions to Carl and to Henry. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Ron. Great to uh, see everybody today. I welcome you from around the world. So the IMPM is done all around the world. And part of the joy of teaching on the IMPM and being a, one of the participants is getting to know people from all over the world and really understanding how they view it differently than yourself and learning from them. So Henry, uh, great as always to spend time with you. Henry, where have you been living during the pandemic? It's been almost two years now. What have you been up to? Where have you been living? We have an apartment in Montreal that is the most expensive apartment in the world because we probably spent, say, 15 nights there in two years. So the uh, it costs us more than the most expensive hotel on earth. Um, but we're cozy here and protected here and do everything we can like this. So it's been, it, it's been uh, great. Uh, I noticed that um, up there, you have some skis and snowshoes. Uh, are you doing that this winter? We've been uh, doing all sorts of things. In fact, we were able to open a, uh, an ice skating rink on the lake uh, the other day, uh, a couple of weeks ago. I opened, I, I checked the ice and there wasn't that much snow on it. So we started to clear a path. Uh, we made about a hundred meter skating rink, narrow, and then I called a neighbor and said, how, how about if we meet? So he started at his house, I continued from our house, we joined it, then we found another neighbor who had an all-terrain vehicle and he opened a kilometer long, one, you know, half a meter wide kilometer or meter wide kilometer long skating rink. So we, we skated 15 days in a row on our lake, it was amazing. Wow. So how has the pandemic impacted you on a personal level? Well, you know, uh, on a personal level, it's, you know, a uh, shame to say it in a way because so many people have suffered. Uh, we haven't suffered at all personally. I mean, we always talked, Elsie and I, about possibly someday living up here and suddenly from one day to the next, we found ourselves living up here uh, and very comfortable. So, and, and, and mercifully, no close member of the family has been badly affected, although some got the new virus, but none have been badly affected. So that's good. The biggest impact on me has been, uh, or at least the biggest impact I perceive is the narrowness with which science has been applied to this pandemic. People are just doing the same thing over and over again. There's been huge resistance, even on the WHO, the World Health Organization, to recognizing even even aerosols they re they wouldn't recognize for months and months. And I tried to do something, write something about the role of pollution in the pandemic. I couldn't get it anywhere. A inference is not allowed. Everything has to be proved, but proof takes years. We don't have years. Henry, this is the most unusual time in our long lives. I think that's probably a fair statement for most of us anyway. How can leaders transcend the environment we're in, in which they lead right now? How, how can we transcend the uh, environment in which we lead? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I think by better understanding uh, what the world is all about and what's happening, not only with regard to the pandemic, um, but 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 there needs to be an openness. When people are afraid, they're 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 more they're less likely to be open. Um, but um, we just need need to have more more openness, I think. And uh, 
uh, with with regard to what's explaining things. T take the pandemic. It's characterized by these immense spikes. I've never seen curves like that. They go straight up and straight down. That's what's happening here in Montreal right now. Straight up and then straight. They don't they don't go like that. They go straight up and straight down. And um, and uh, I don't see anybody trying to explain that. That's not it's not usual. There's something. There's something else going on, and we're not open to it. Uh, okay. So the next question, this is, uh, I sh I'm sorry, I, I should mention who they're from. You can see that, but Abdibla Atid from Morocco. Why are there no longer any real leaders at the world level, yet the great causes are not lacking? Well, uh, I think the... Uh, um, we we uh, we have uh, if they're leaders, um, then they're uh, then they're changing things. Um, but they're not leaders. Uh, so so you know uh, there are leaders. There are all kinds of leaders out there, and and they're not uh, coming to the fore. So we're not lacking great leaders. We're just not getting them. I think the nature of politics and the stridency of conflict and all those things, uh, perhaps are discouraging people like Nelson Mandela and those kinds of people, of whom there are many, from coming into positions of power. This is a very dangerous situation, I think. This is uh, from Kayla Noel here from, uh, from Canada. What is the best quality a leader can have? Um, I have a list, uh, Kaylin, of 52 of them. Um, and they're all the best. Um, in other words, there are so many qualities that a leader has to have that nobody can possibly have all of them. So we pick people for the qualities that are most important in the job, but we also have to pick people for their weaknesses, for their failures, uh, uh, because that could bring them down. So you, you choose leaders or managers, I prefer to say, you choose leaders or managers who, um, who have... Uh, um, won't have weaknesses that will bring them down in the job. Um, in other words, selection processes should look as, at weaknesses as much as they look at, at strengths. Uh, of course, you can't, um, uh, it's very hard to know what a person's weakness is unless two things, unless you work for them uh, or you marry them. Now, uh, you can't, we can't ask spouses to comment on candidates for managerial jobs, but we can ask people who were led by candidates what they think of their management. And that could improve the practice of management phenomenally. Too often, it's, it's superiors, in quotes, who choose subordinates. They, senior people pick junior people. And too often, uh, the people get the jobs are what's called kiss up and kick down people. They know how to... Uh, kiss up to senior people, but they mistreat junior people. And we get a lot of abuse uh, in management from, some, from these people. So the next question is uh, from James Casilla, who's an IMPM grad, I remember him. Uh, he, his wife also took uh, one of our programs as well. So James is in Kenya. Henry, heroic leaders seem to dominate the leadership landscape of many important institutions, including NGOs. How do you suggest we build the next generation of leaders? Uh, well, clearly from the last question, not the way we built the last generation of leaders. The, the trouble is, you know, I, I, James, it's nice to hear from you and see you, or at least uh, speak to you again. Um, we, we need to um, uh, be careful how we select the leaders and, um, uh, and, and build them. Uh, in the last generation, we didn't choose the right kinds of people. I, I think the first thing we could do is just get rid of the word leadership. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, we have too much, too much obsession with leadership. And so we have all kinds of people running around saying, I'm a leader, I'm a leader. Well, you're not a leader if you claim you're a leader. You're a leader if other people think you're a leader. But, but we don't need so much leadership. We need community ship. We need people from the ground up who are doing things. And then we need managers, let's call them managers rather than leaders, we need managers to encourage that community ship. So maybe the best way to improve uh, leadership is to encourage community ship. And as James well knows, and, and 
and his wife uh, also knows, uh, we, um, we uh, have programs, uh, a couple of programs each that are different one that encourage that kind of leadership by, by engaging people to work with each other instead of putting them on a pedestal. You know, in a case study classroom, you're on a pedestal, you're pronouncing. In our classrooms, we'll get to that in a minute, you, you interact with each other. So our next question is uh, Philippe Piccioni, and I apologize, Philippe, if I mispronounce that, from Brazil. Henry, how does one measure management? Badly. <laughs> Badly. We can't measure management. We can't measure love. We can't measure culture. We can't measure leadership. Uh, these things are all extremely difficult to measure. And so the best way to deal with man measuring management is not to try and measure it at all, but to judge it. I don't know if anybody ever remembers judgment. It used to be a word in the English language, judgment, um, but we've lost it. We judge management. We don't, we don't measure management. You know, we measure, uh, I don't know, the stairs in a building or something, but we don't measure uh, management. We can't do it and we should stop wasting our time doing it. And we should certainly stop assuming that shareholder value is a measure of management. The, the, the extent to which you've, as a CEO, the extent to which you've increased the share price. That's short-term and destructive. So we have two questions. Uh, one from Rafael Motocina from the USA. Do you think that maximizing shareholder value is finally dying, or do you think it is just good PR for companies? I hope it's finally dying, um, and a lot of it is PR. The Business Roundtable, which is a meeting of, of, of prominent chief executives of American companies, met in 2019 and issued a statement that it's really about stakeholders, not just shareholders. That was terrific, except in 2012, the same group issued exactly the same statement with different words. And between 2012 and 2019, things got worse. So please, no more statements. It's, it is a lot of PR. Um, but I think this question is really ans answered by the next question, Ian's question. Let me just, Ian says, uh, 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 many argue a company's ultimate mission is to deliver as much value as possible for shareholders. I personally believe that every organization needs to have a deeper person purpose than that. Um, I think that's the answer to Raphael's question. Uh, every organization needs to have a deeper pur purpose than shareholder value. Otherwise, what kind of a world do we have? Uh, well, we have the world we're seeing right now, which is a completely distorted world in favor of, of, of certain groups and destructive of many, many others. It's interesting, my undergraduates totally agree that they're looking for purpose when they want to join a company. So my undergrads would absolutely be in strong agreement with you, Henry. Juan Rodriguez from Canada says, what is your opinion about the future of MBAs are they still relevant? And I can't help but think about your book, Managers, Not MBAs. Yeah, Juan, um, I, I, I think you might have made a mistake when you typed this. Didn't you mean, are they still irrelevant? Um, <laughs> um, uh, or, or, or let me put it differently. Um, they're much too relevant. Um, MBA programs are terrific, excellent for training in the business functions. Uh, marketing, finance, accounting, excellent. I'm all in favor of them. This is no way to learn how to become a manager. Management is not a science, it's not a profession, it's a practice. Um, and it's got a lot of craft based on experience and some art, as much art as you can, based on insight and vision. Um, and it uses whatever science it can. Um, but you can't teach the art um, and you can't teach the craft to people who've never practiced management. So the MBA programs teach the science, they teach the analysis. That's why they're so good at marketing and finance and accounting. Um, but if you're gonna run, an, if you're gonna train managers then you, uh, or develop managers, you have to take people who are managers who understand the practice and then give them a chance to share uh, their experiences with each other and work with each other. And that's what we've done in our programs. Here's from Nora Abedasidi from Canada. How does the programs such as the IMPMU found to prepare someone in this fast pacing and changing world? And, and how is this program different from others around the world? Well, 
it's um it's 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 different because it it takes managers which of course EMBA programs do uh, but then they do with them largely what they do with the regular students uh, it's as if to say your experience doesn't matter uh, what we do in two programs the IMPM uh, that Ron mentioned, the International Master's Program for Managers and the IMHL, the International Master's for Health Leadership. We take people who are deeply experienced. They're typically in their 40s. Some of them are in their 60s, 50s, but typically in their 40s on average. Um, and we give, them a we give them a chance to share their insights with each other. They work with each other. And, and, and they reflect on their own experience and they learn from their own experience. So 50% of the time we're giving them our inputs, uh, but 50% of the time they're running with those inputs or other ideas and sharing them with each other and learning from each other's experience. That's incredibly powerful, but you can't do that with people who don't have experience in management. Here's a question from Bianca S.A. from Brazil. How do you believe that the IMPM promotes greater equality of knowledge between the global north and south? Do you believe that the knowledge of the participating peripheral countries is also taken to the north? You know, one of the characteristics of both programs is that there's no status differences within the class. Everybody in the class can learn from everybody else. And it doesn't take long for a manager in Sri Lanka to realize, or for a manager in Canada or the US, to realize they have as much to learn from a manager in Sri Lanka who's facing, facing some of their problems in much more intense different ways than they can from fellow managers in Canada or the US. In the healthcare program, uh, one comment that's always interested me, and we get it often, is from physicians who say, I, I, I never realized in all my years of practicing medicine uh, what public health was all, all, all about until I came to the class and I had a colleague in public health and we were chatting a lot on and off in these workshops and I found out what public health is all about. So the conversation always goes two ways. The person in public health finds out more about what's going on in the hospitals. And, and, and so there's a, a, a kind of an equal sense that everybody is capable of learning from everybody else. And, and hardly just from we as faculty. Sure, they learn from us, but we learn from them as faculty. So there's a kind of an open sharing in that, in that classroom. I recall, Henry, that we have the 50-50 rule where at most the faculty can speak 50% of the time. And I've seen you many, many times listen with rapt attention to the participants. You're learning from them. Yeah, absolutely. We should pay them. Don't don't <laughs> anybody. Bassem El Beltege from Canada, can you define what the new normal will look like in light of the current pandemic? Yeah, sure, like the old normal. Um, we're, we're not, we're, the world's not gonna change drastically. As soon as this eases off, everybody's gonna go back more or less to where they were. Um, uh, the, the, the less is what we'll take up maybe in the next question. Um, maybe I can, comment on that one. Nancy is a dear old friend, and this is the first time we've connected in maybe 20 years, Nancy. It's so wonderful to see you uh, coming in with a question. Um, and I want to tell you a story about Nancy. First, I'll read her question. What do you think will be the changes in practice stemming from the recent two years of remote meeting, teaching, working? Um, I got to tell a good story about Nancy because it explains a lot about the program. Nancy became quite famous for developing an executive program at Ford that was really, really a good program. And when I heard about it, and we were just beginning to develop the IMPM, I got in touch with Nancy and she was incredibly helpful. We had periodic phone calls and, you know, how do I do this and what should I do there and so on and so forth. One day, Nancy says to me on one of these calls, how are you seating them, Henry? And at that point, we hadn't started. We hadn't even thought about it. So I said, I guess in one of those Harvard-type U-shaped classrooms, Nancy. And she shot back, not those obstetric stirrups. <laughs> and we got the point. Um, and that was a huge turning point for us. We put them on round tables in a flat classroom so they could go in and out of workshops quickly. They could share and so on. And with that, we not only use round tables, which lots of people do, but we developed a whole bunch of 
creative things that were really quite, that really proved to be quite terrific. For example, uh, Jonathan Gosling used this term, he's part of the program. Uh, he talked about uh, keynote listeners. So when they're doing a workshop discussing something at a table, let's say I, I lecture them on emergent strategy, and then they discuss how they could use emergent strategy in their company. Sometimes we'll have one member of the table turn his or her back to the table. Uh, so so that so they're not part of the conversation and they're the ones who report out so instead of saying i had such a clever idea they're saying i heard such a clever idea and then so sometimes we'll put them in a fishbowl in the middle of the class all those all those keynote listeners from each of the tables and they'll have a conversation with each other with everybody else listening in about what they heard and then after a while if anybody wants to join in, they tap one of those people on the shoulder and replace them. So you always have a running conversation of six or eight people, uh, but others join coming and going. Lots of creative stuff like that in our program. And that was thanks to Nancy originally. So in, in terms of her specific question, um, this is the question everybody is so curious about. We I, I do a blog called minsberg.org slash blog. And we did one called Zooming Ahead not so fast. You can look it up and see the details. Um, and our point was, uh, we know about the incredible advantages of, of working at home and, and working on Zoom and hold, holding meetings and different things on Zoom. And you know, how else am I going to talk to hundreds of people like this, except on this kind of a, a, a situation? So it, we know the advantages and they're stunning. We also know that a lot of people like to work at home. Um, as an academic, like most of my colleagues, we always like to work at home. So the reason my life didn't change so much is because I went from doing 60 or 70 percent at home to, to 100 percent at home. Other people went from zero to 100 um, percent. But the disadvantages are quite clear. There's no coffee machine on Zoom. Carl, if you and I were doing this personally, in a room, at the end of it all, we'd have a chat, what worked, what didn't work, how is it going, how are the kids? Uh, we'd have all that conversation, jazé, comme on dit au Québec, we jazzed. Um, um, we can't, we have no coffee machine uh, on, we have no, no convenient after uh, conversation on Zoom. You can work with people who you know and in a culture that you've developed yourself very hard to get to know new people and to create a new culture on Zoom. So, so I'm, I would hope that we would capture, like every new technique, we would not go overboard, but we would capture the best of this um, uh, uh, in Zoom and everything else uh, and, 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 and maintain uh, work situations where we have to, where people have to brainstorm and get creative and need a whiteboard and need to walk around the room. All of that will not be foregone. So do you like the model of a couple days a week at work and the other days at home? Or do you think we should go back to five days a week at work for the average kind of organization? Well, I, I, I wouldn't average because it really depends on, on what you're doing. Um, if you're... Uh, um, if you're constantly in intense meetings to brainstorm about some project, I think you've got to be significantly at work. Um, uh, in fact, a combination, uh, some software companies, uh, consulting companies use a combination of that, which is, you know, you work in Boston in the day shift, and then you switch it all to India for their day shift, um, and then they send it back to you so you continue... To work on it. So each group may be working together personally, um, but you use the technology back and forth. Of course, in software development, it may be more personal or individual, so you might be able to slice it up. But where you need conversation, you really need to be together. So uh, here's another question from Brazil. Are there any considerable updates on your writings related to the fall and rise of strategic planning due to this pandemic scenario we're in? No, no. Um, strategic planning is an oxymoron. You don't plan strategy, you learn strategy. Um, and uh, it was an oxymoron before the pandemic and it will remain an oxymoron after the pandemic and people will still 
go through all kinds of gyrations to pretend they're doing strategic planning where when most of the time they're really doing strategic programming they're really just pursuing the consequence of the strategy they have we talk about deliberate emergent strategy and i was teaching it to my undergrads just last week in the core strategy class where did the idea your idea of emergent strategy where did it emerge from i'm just curious it <laughs> It, it emerged from uh, a sentence I read by Herbert Simon years ago. Um, Simon was the most profound management thinker uh, ever. Um, and um, he wrote something about uh, in inference about strategy as pattern and decision making. Um, and, and that really struck me because I, my first article was about strategy. I was, you know, my field is really strategy and organization together. Um, and it occurred to me uh, that we use the word strategy differently often than we define it. So we all define strategy as a plan, uh, uh, going ahead, you know, uh, moving forward, looking ahead, vision. Strategy is always from now into the future. That's the definite, every dictionary. But people will often say, aha, but look at the strategy that Google's pursuing now, people outside Google. And how are they doing this? They're inferring pattern. They're seeing what Google is doing. Uh, you know, let's say it's making all its products turquoise, I don't know, it's just a silly example. And, and, and therefore it has a strategy of turquoise products. Um, uh, in other words, there's pattern in action, pattern in what they're doing. Um, and, uh, but, but, so then I go through this routine where I'm teaching strategy to managers, like in our programs or in other things. And I say, okay, how do you define strategy? And I get the usual answers, plan, etc. And then I say, uh, uh, okay, um, uh, if I asked you what the strategy of your organization has really pursued over the last 10 years, would you answer that question? Of course, they all say, yeah, of course. I say, well, wait a minute. I'm not asking you about their plans. I'm not talking about their intentions. I'm talking about what they really did for 10 years. How come you're willing to answer that question? No dictionary defines strategy as pattern in the past, but we use it that way all the time, okay? And that led me to start to think about deliberate and emergent strategies, that if we intend a strategy, if we have a plan and we realize it, good, that's called a deliberate strategy. You, you planned and you executed. So the, the, the pattern, the, the intended strategy was the same as the realized strategy. Um, uh, if you achieved a strategy, a pattern that wasn't what you intended, I call that an emergent strategy. You learned it. Step by step, you tried things, some worked, some didn't, you kept reinforcing what worked. Eventually you converge and that's your the, uh, emergent strategy. Well, when I asked these managers in that classroom, um, how many of your strategies were more or less deliberate and how many of your strategies were more or less emergent? Um, uh, uh, very few say that our strategy was deliberate. Very few say we planned it and executed it. Very few, like often, 10, 15%. It's quite shocking because all the literature is about deliberate strategy. When I say how many were purely emergent, you didn't have a clue. What you intended was, what you realized was completely different from what you intended. Um, again, I get you know, 10, 15%, 20%. When I say, oh, okay, so it was a mixture, I get, 70, I get 60, 70 in other words, strategy is always a combination of intentions and realizations. And, 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 and that's why emergent strategy is just as important or more important than deliberate strategy, because strategy is a learning process. It seems during the pandemic, no one knew what we're going to do. So that's particularly emergent strategy during these times when it's so unpredictable and we can't really look to the past easily for lessons. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We, we've been through, and yet, you know, politicians, you know, we blame politicians. We, we say, for example, gee, they keep changing their mind. You know, last week they told us to close the schools. This week they're telling us to open the schools. What the heck's wrong with them? Well, you try and manage this process. I'm sorry. I know all the mistakes and failures like anybody else, but 
boy, it's not easy. And it's, and it's most hard if you believe in deliberate strategy. The World Health Organization time and time again has fixated on certain explanations and they won't give in. It took them the longest time to recognize even asymptomatic transmission. Uh, and then, and then um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, the other transmission, um, uh, aerosol transmission through the tiny little particles. You know, they had this two meter thing going for years, months and months and months. And we're still where we started, you know that? Other than the only major breakthrough, I think really major breakthrough are the vaccinations. Uh, otherwise, it's the same thing. Wear masks, keep your distance, don't touch things, or maybe now you can touch things. We, we just go on and on and on about the same things. And we're not opening our minds to new interpretations, new inferences. You know, science rejects inference in a way, which is an absurd comment. But, but I can't publish anything that's inferential uh, because who am I? And, uh, and, and, and where have you done your research? Well, I have an inference that pollution, and, 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 and a lot of that has come through in article after article, but it took two years. I had an inference in, in April. In April of 2000, 2020, I re read about an article uh, uh, in Italy uh, where it looked like the, the uh, aerosols although we weren't using that word at the time, I wasn't, we're, we're being carried by polluted air. We're being carried around by polluted air. And I had just written a, um, a, a blog at the end of March in 2020, listing a whole series of, uh, of uh, um, things that you know, just didn't make sense, anomalies. Uh, for example, why was it at that time, particularly not with this variant, but earlier, why was it that while the the, the cases were everywhere, the outbreaks were not. In other words, you had people who had COVID everywhere at some point, but you didn't have, you didn't have uh, outbreaks everywhere. And why now with, with the latest variant, uh, does Quebec and Ontario have this huge um, sudden surge enormous surge, whereas Alberta, why did Alberta have a sudden surge months ago and now uh, isn't necessarily following here? So, and, and then Montreal goes up, 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 up enormously and then drops. Like, as I said earlier, it, it's not rounded, it's not kind of gradually drop. What in the world would stop it from changing from one day to the next? You know, somebody might say sunspots or something. I mean, <laughs> What would cause it to turn around often on a day? There was around January 22nd with earlier variants where a number of them went up and down. So people say, well, it was obviously Christmas and grouping. And I say, well, uh, and, and they started to wear masks. I said, like on January 22nd, they started to wear masks, like not on the 21st, not on the 23rd. Who's, answer, who's not answering, forget, who's addressing these questions? It's terrible. We're not, we're just, science is getting in the way, narrow science. Real science deals with inference. That's how DNA was developed by Crick and Watson. You know, Franklin, who, who, who was trying to do the same thing, was blocked because she didn't accept inference. Watson and Crick were playing with all kinds of explanations until they come up, came up with the double helix. Inference is key. Of course you want to prove things, but inference is key, especially with a pandemic where people are dying and, uh, and we don't have explanations, which was the case at the beginning. Let me, let's get back to a couple of the, some more of the wonderful questions we have from the participants here. Amy Kelly from the UK, how do you keep the energy alive through computer screens? You know, we picked that question because I don't have a clue how to answer it, but I find it so interesting. Um, I guess I'm energetic because I have feelings about pollution. I have feelings about other work I'm doing. Um, so, uh, so we can keep it alive that way. Um, uh, but look, we used to keep energy alive through books, didn't we? And articles. So why can't we keep energy alive through computer screens, I guess, but interesting question. I think you actually set a good example, Henry, of doing it, and we, we appreciate that. Pat, uh, 
Venkat from India, what would be the most important management lesson taught by the COVID-19 pandemic? So, so Padma is another dear friend who we just connected uh, by virtue of this event. So hi, Padma. So delightful to hear from you. Padma ran the uh, Ayurvedic Hospital in Bangalore and now is a dean uh, in public health in Chennai, I, I believe still. Um, you know, let me take out the word management. What would be the most important lesson taught by the COVID-19 pandemic? Because I think there's one big, big, big message. And that is when we're back when our back's against the wall, we will do things that we never would have dreamed of doing, okay? Like locking down people, locking down whole societies, closing down industries. I mean, who, if somebody said that in 2018, you'd consider them a lunatic, and yet we did it. Um, so the message is when we really want to change, we can do it. Now, what do we really want to change? Climate change. What we really want to change is climate change. And yet we, we do all kinds of strange things and, and avoid it in any way possible. The, the best way to avoid it is, uh, is um, uh, that, we could have, that we've seen in COP26, which I call COP out 26, because it's the 26th time we've copped out on climate change. We, we, um, we uh, change, uh, um, we need to change the, uh, the um, way we deal with that. And, um, and I think that we will never get anywhere, anywhere with climate change until we rebalance society. In other words, climate change is a manifestation in large part of a problem that we're failing to deal, deal with. What I want to say before is the worst part of dealing with climate change is what I call four-year governments that make 40-year plans. It's a joke. It's a joke. You get governments who are elected for four years making these decade-long plans. And as soon as, you know, so, so Obama makes a plan for decades and Trump comes in, throws it in the garbage, and Biden comes in and renews it, and somebody else will come in and throw it in the garbage. It's not about planning. Please stop the planning. Act. Do. Don't tell me what you're doing tomorrow. Tell me what you're doing today, because we'll get nowhere. And the only way we'll get somewhere is to realize that climate change will get nowhere without a rebalancing of society. And maybe that, I think that's the next set of questions. Wait, that are so Henry, you talk about rebalancing society. What do you mean by that? And why is that important? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, so you want to get to that? I guess we've answered the uh, strategy questions. So maybe you can go to the next one. Eh? I think the next one is about uh, eh? the next slide. I'm. Uh, no. Uh, uh, well, I think. Uh, can, can anyway, talk, I'll, I'll, I'll can come back. Okay. Talk to us about rebalancing society and how do we get out of balance and how do we get back or get to balance? Yeah, there is a question, I think, in the next one about what's what makes me passionate or yeah, what yeah. are your latest yeah, what are you working on now that are your latest passions? And the 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 answer singular is rebalancing society. So let me tell the story. How are we doing for I think we're okay for time. Oh, so yeah. so let me tell you the story. In 1991, I visited Prague. This was two years after the Velvet Revolution in, in Czechoslovakia at the time, and, uh, and, and two years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, and the explanation in, uh, in, in the Western world was that capitalism had triumphed, that this was a Cold War, a battle between capitalism and communism, and capitalism won. Goody for us. Um, uh, dead wrong absolutely dead wrong. Um, balance triumphed. The Eastern European countries were completely out of balance on the side of public sector governments. Government controlled pretty much everything. The Western democracies were in balance at the time between three sectors, not two, between public sector government, private sector enterprise, and what I call plural sector associations. Plural sector is the community sector. It's this huge sector of, um, of all kinds of organizations that are owned by nobody or owned by their members as co-ops, uh, but not by investors and not by governments. So McGill is, McGill is uh, the IMPM, McGill, Greenpeace, uh, 
charities, foundations, uh, not-for-profit hospitals, uh, huge, huge numbers of these organizations, but they're obscure because our politics has always been left and right. Pendulum politics, back and forth between left and right. You need a third leg to balance a society. You can't do it on two legs. And the third leg is the community, what I call plural sector or civil society leg. Some people, most people call it civil society. I call it plural because plural, public, private need to be seen to go together. The Western democracies uh, before the fall of the Berlin Wall were balanced. Um, uh, the United States in the 70s had huge welfare programs with, or earlier with Johnson. Uh, they had very high taxation rates and yet their economies were booming. Then along comes Reagan and then everybody else after 1989 with the belief that capitalism has triumphed. And you know what? Capitalism triumphed after that. That we have gone way out of balance on the side of private sector businesses. Uh, got, uh, particularly in the United States, completely out of control. And, and that, I think, is the common cause of pollution, of not, well, pollution for sure, but of uh, climate change because we consume too much. Um, we, we use too much carbon energy um, um, and we can't stop it. There were 300 lobbyists from the energy businesses alone at COPA. 26, 300 of them, more than any single national delegation, and many of them part of delega national delegations. And I'm ashamed to say that some were part of the Canadian delegation. So we give people who have overt agendas a seat at the table. Absolutely crazy. So, so Western countries were, were in balance. The Supreme Court of the United States kind of put the nail in the last nail in the coffin when they legalized bribery. Uh, Citizens United was a decision that opened the floodgates to um, political donations. Uh, what the Supreme Court of the United States did is it legalized bribery. And, uh, and the United States is out of control right now because everybody in Congress is doing what they like, or at least the Republicans, for sure. Um, very, very dangerous. America is, is not in danger of, it's losing its democracies. So, so, so ever since 2000, uh, ever since 1991, I was working on uh, rebalancing society. And uh, um, I did a book called, called Rebalancing Society in 2015. And then I developed a website uh, a few months ago called rebalancingsociety.org that describes how we might get out of this mess. Uh, and I think it's a question of what I call reformation, uh, similar to what happened in Luther's time, a groundswell from the ground up, not from leaders, not from the top, a groundswell from the ground up that changes uh, society. And um, if we don't do that, I think we're in dire straits, not only, not only from, uh, from um, uh, climate change, uh, but from income disparities, from the rise of populism, because people are fed up with democracy, they're fed up with globalization, which is economic globalization. So they, uh, so they vote populist and look what's happening in countries like Hungary and Venezuela. It doesn't matter if it's left or right. Hungary, Venezuela, Nicaragua, uh, Turkey, uh, Russia, uh, all with populist government. We've got to wake up. We've got to wake up. So rebalancing society and that website is really my central passion and focus uh, today. We did a, we did a, uh, uh, we wrote a declaration of our interdependence. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created dependent uh, on each other, uh, our earth and its climate. And it goes on like that. Anybody can sign it if they, if they go to rebalancingsociety.org. Or, or go to our, inter, our interdependence.org. So that's my passion. I hope it's come through the screen. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly has. I was going to ask you now that you're over 70, why don't you retire? But I think we just saw why you don't retire is your passion and your desire to make the world better. Yeah, nobody ever referred to me as retiring. Retiring. <laughs> <laughs> so Sylvie LeDuc uh, from Canada, What's your most valuable learning lesson that you wish to impart to our youth, 
around the world. Yeah, hi Sylvie, another friend. Um, uh, uh, wake up to what's going on in the world. Read the rebalancing site. Go out and do something to make a change in the imbalance in society. There's a table on that site that gives you about 35 ways that you can do what you can do as you as an individual in your community, in your business, in your government, what you can do to change things. Look at that site. You study management for decades now. Probably one of the most important elements in the world is healthcare management. What thoughts or advice might you have for better healthcare management? You know, healthcare management has a bum rap in a certain way. Um, uh, uh, when I speak to people all over the world, they all say that their own healthcare system is failing. Every healthcare system in the world is failing. Um, I, uh, I was at a party with a friend of my daughter's who's a radiologist. Um, she was at the party and she was going on and on and on about healthcare in Quebec. And finally I said, well, you did your your uh, your residency in the states what about the american healthcare system she threw up her hands and said don't get me started on the american system so so uh, uh, healthcare is failing everywhere wrong healthcare is succeeding everywhere amazingly amazingly i'm more than 70 i'm well over 70 and i wouldn't be here if not for open heart surgery um it's expensive it's expensive but it's brilliant we don't want to pay for it the problem with healthcare is not healthcare. The problem with healthcare is taxes. We don't want to pay. It's expensive. Physicians are brilliant at finding new ways to save our lives. They're great at it, uh, but they're expensive and we don't want to pay for it. So governments cut taxes. Now we've got this joke of a, of a minimum global tax on minimum tax on corporations of 15%. That's not a minimum, that's a maximum because everybody's gonna come down to 15%. So while, while you and I, Carl, are paying 40 or 50% at the margin, they wanna pay 15%. It's a, it's a joke. So, so we've got to change uh, uh, the, the way we deal with these things. And um, uh, in healthcare, it's suffering from that lack, lack of, of taxation. Um, and uh, uh, look, there are other things. Healthcare can be fixed. There's no question about it. And I think healthcare needs to give a lot more attention to cause. Uh, it's wonderful at cure. It's not always so good at cause. And yet, if we find the cause of an illness, we don't need to cure it. If we can find a cause and find a way to stop it. Um, so, you know, with a lot of cancers, it's a lot cheaper and a lot more effective to stop those cancers. But, you know, if you're giving a, a million dollars for a chair in a university, you're going to give it for cure because maybe you had a relative who got that cancer. Um, but, uh, but you should be giving it for cause, but there's no constituency for cause because, you know, I'm not a cause for MS because I don't have MS. So therefore, I, I, I'm not lobbying for MS in particular, except I am in a way, because I'm saying, you know, as a kid in Ottawa, not a kid, I guess, in his 20s, who ha had a bad case or has a bad case of MS, um, and um, he discovered that several kids on his block got it. Well, what a perfect opportunity to investigate cause. What's going on on that block? But epidemiologists don't do that. They sit mostly in the air, uh, and they're looking at statistics. And one was interviewed on CBC when when uh, when when he was talking about this problem and she said well we'd have to check it out to make sure well come on you know four kids on the block yeah check it out but that'll take you 20 minutes you know uh we so 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 the the, the problem in healthcare is success not failure and um and uh, we need to uh, we need to come to our senses about our taxes and how we deal with things I think we've covered the one from Carol, so we'll go to the last question. This is from Beth Kerr from the US. Henry, what gives you hope? Uh, Carl, this gives me hope. Um, your reference to your students gives me hope. Um, people who are willing to sit, I guess we still got a lot left, people who are willing to sit for an hour and listen to me pontificate, uh, gives me hope, not because I'm so smart necessarily, but at least they're concerned about what's going on in the world. 
Um, my students give me hope. Uh, uh, let me end with a story. I, I love this story. Um, there's a woman named Mel in England who had kids, has kids, um, and went to see their teacher because they weren't learning about um, climate change. And she said, why don't we teach them? Why don't you teach them about climate change? And they said, we don't have material. So Mel uh, created, an, and, and maybe Ron can put this, the, the link to it. Mel created an organism, Mel created material for the teachers and now has 300,000 schools using that material. Talk about ground up, talk about groundswell, talk about just getting out and doing things. She didn't need a leadership. She didn't need a prime minister, God help her, and the British prime minister. She's British, but she didn't need all that. Um, she just went and did it, okay? And then Debbie, who's another one who sent questions in and is probably listening, uh, Debbie told her about rebalancing society. And Mel immediately got excited and said, oh, that's the next step kind of thing. So Mel and Debbie and others are now creating modules to teach rebalancing society in schools. And there's actually a video up on my YouTube channel um, of kids, 14-year-old kids in a school ask me questions about rebalancing society. That gives me hope. Henry, thanks for the hour. 